Welcome to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is about network address translation for IPv4. Uh, first, let's talk about a little background. Uh, since 1981, there has been available 4.3 billion IPv4 addresses. And the exhaustion of these addresses was estimated before year 2000. Uh, IPv6 was, well, is a long term solution and a short-term solution is NAT and the RFC and the RFC is like the division of the private internet addresses which came in class A, class B and class C uh, well some facts are that there are not enough public addresses available uh, because of the short-term solutions networks commonly use private ones uh, they use private addresses for local communication, but these addresses cannot be routed to internet. Uh, translation is needed, and there is the space for NAT to does well not does it. Uh, there's also the fact that a unique IPv4 address can support thousands of private ones. Uh, NAT is a prim well is primarily used to conserve IPv4 addresses. It translates when needed. Uh, it uses a pool of public addresses. Uh, this can change. Uh, we're going to see that. And it's used by the border router. The border router is like the router, as we can see in the big picture. It's the router that divides the private address space from the public address space. Uh, this is a common topology most of us may find uh, at home without the switches, of course. Uh, of a stop network, which it's a network that own that only has one exit point to the internet. Uh, what R2 does as a net router is that it translates public addresses into private ones and private addresses into public ones. There are several types of addresses. The first one is the inside address, which is an address of a device that can be well that it's going to be translated by NAT an outside address which is a destination device address uh, commonly referred to a public address a local address which is any address inside the network and a global address which is an ad any address outside the network all these terms uh, depend a lot in perspective what I mean for this is that it depends what are we seeing and where are we standing it's the definition or the, the type of address an address might be uh, in this example we can see that an inside address can be the one found on PC1 it's a private address and it's inside the network an outside address uh, might be the web server which has a public address and it's outside the network well, there is some terminology we need to start knowing because NAT uh, works around this. All the types of addresses are based on perspective. That's a fact and we cannot change it. Addresses can be considered as inside local address, an inside global address, an outside local address, and an outside global address. Uh, well, let's go slowly in this step. As we can see in the image, we have several addresses. And inside local, if we go from the top front to the bottom, we can see that uh, inside local, it's considered to be the PC1 private address. And an outside local can be considered that the private address once was translated to a public one, and it's the, the pink one. That address, it's an outside local. It's local because the router R2 assigned it to the private address, but still it is a public address. And, and inside global address can be considered to be the web server, but that web server can also be considered as an outside global address. And most of the cases, the inside global is going to correspond to an outside global address, but that's not every time. So we need to be careful from where are we standing to see and to determine which type of address an address will be.
Well, here's a quick video of how NAT works. Uh, PC1 sends a packet with a private address which reaches R2. R2 checks its NAT table and assigns a public one so the packet can go through the internet. The web server answers to the public address and sends it back. So router checks the public address and translates it to a private one so the packet can reach and move through the private network and reach P the PC that send the packet. There are several types of NAT. The first one is the static NAT. It's configured by the network admin and it's look like kind of a special NAT. Each private address has its own public address. I mean no public address has two private addresses or the other way around. Uh, many public addresses are needed and web servers with consistent addresses use it commonly. Uh, here we have the table or the image with example. If we can see the static net table, we can see that the inside local addresses or the private ones, each one of them has its own inside global address or public address. This means that for every device connected to our inside network, we have, we have to have a public address available for them. It's like one to one ratio. There, then we have the dynamic net. Dynamic net uh, works like the static one using a pool of public addresses, but it differs on how those addresses are assigned to the private ones. It uses a technique you name as first come, first serve. And uh, public addresses are free to be assigned. Uh, this works a lot like DHCP. Uh, we have a pool of addresses and every time a private or an inside address wants to communicate to the outside uh, sends its packet and when the packet reaches R2 R2 uh, sees its dynamic NAT table or IPv4 NAT pool and sees which public addresses are available or are not being used by another private address so the packet is assigned to that public address as a, as, as we can see the the network 192.168.10.12 is already using one of the public addresses so in case the server wants to connect to the internet the next available public address is going to be assigned to his own private address Finally, we have the port address translation, also denominated as PAT. PAT is one of the most used as the NAT services uh, because it works with port numbers instead of public addresses or several public addresses and uses the TCP UDP port numbers. And uh, here's a quick piece of how PAT process uh, works. Mm, sorry about that. And here it is. We have that both computers want to send some packets. These packets, uh, well, before they're translated, here they are. Here, here, yeah, here it is. Before they are uh, translated, both are using their own private addresses, but with different ports. The first one is using the port 1555, and the second PC2 is using the port 1331. The destination addresses are two different servers, server 1 and server 2. Oh, sorry about that again. When both addresses reaches the router, the router sees its NAT table and changes for a public address uh, to correspond with each packet. The difference here is that there is only one available public address which is the the one that terminates in 226 the difference here is that with the address it comes the port so one packet is it has the same public IP address but it has the different port as we can see the one above uses the port 155 such as the PC one was using and the lower one uses port 1331 such as PC2 was using what this does is that well 
packets are sent within, within the same public address but with different ports but what if, well, in the case a port is already being used in this example we can assume that well, as we can see in the video that PC1 is sending a packet from its own private address with a port 1444 and wants to communicate to the internet so it reaches the router the router sees its not table and assigns the inside global IP addresses it needs with that port with port 1444 the packet goes to the internet and well PC1 just waits for the reply but in the meantime PC2 wants to send the same packet well, it's a, well not the same packet but sends a similar packet which, with its own private address but it uses the same port as PC1 so well you may think that the router is going to have trouble but instead the router assigns a different packet assigns the packet a different port number uh, in the in the NAT table he knows that he assigns a different port number in this case he assigns with the public address the port 1445 instead of the 1444 but in the table it keeps when whenever he receives a packet with the port 1445 he knows he has to forward that packet to PC2 instead of PC1 that that's the magic of Pat Pat can in case a port number is used he can automatically assign new ports but without losing the original port the packet was meant to here is a comparison between NAT and PAT NAT as we can see uses a uh, inside global address pool it doesn't matter if it's static or dynamic most of the cases a pool is needed for different inside local addresses in the other hand PAT can work only with one inside global addresses address but it changes the ports that address is using and that's because we can we, well that's because well that's because in every other well that's because we have different private or inside local addresses that are using different ports or in, and in case one port is being used for from a private from a different private uh, address, uh, Pat can change the port address in the translation. Uh, here are some advantages and disadvantages of NAT. Uh, in the side of the advantages, we can find that NAT conserves the legally registered addressing scheme. It increases the flexibility of connections to a public network. Provides consistency for internal network addressing schemes and provides network security. On the other hand, the disadvantages of NAT is that performance is degraded, uh, the end-to-end -end functionality is degraded, the end-to-end -end IP traceability is lost, tunneling becomes more complicated, and initiating TCP connections can be disrupted. Well, how do we configure these well, different nets. Well, for static net, we have several steps we have to follow. First of all, we have to establish a static translation between private and public addresses. Uh, this is that for every inside local addresses, we have to have an inside global address. Then the second step is to specify the inside interface. That means which interface is connected to the inside network then we have to mark that interface as connected to the inside then we have to do the same with the outside interface and finally we have to mark the, that interface as an outside interface here is an example of a topology that uses a static NAT configuration and the commands display in order to achieve this and uh, this is like a summary of how NAT process works um, here the client with a public address sends a packet to, to the web server using a public address that address reaches R2 
R2 router uh, checks it's not stable and decides that the public address is binded to that inside local address which is the one for the web server translates it so in step 3 we can see now that the packet has a private address instead of a public one uh, it reaches the web server the web server uh, forwards or sends another packet with its own public with sorry with its own private address it reaches the router again and what the router does is exactly the same it checks which outside local address it needs and it changes between a private address through a well, to a public address which now it's going to be directly sent to the client to configure dynamic NAT uh, well we have several steps and uh, the step one is to define our global pool well a pool of global addresses all the public addresses we can gather the step two is to configure a standard access list so we can allow the private addresses uh, to be translated then we have to bind that access list to the pool so well each private addresses know from which public addresses can be assigned and then we have to identify the interfaces and mark them in the case of the example uh, we have that R2 has uh, its own well zero interface zero 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 is the inside network interface and zero and serial zero one zero is the outside network interface we can see some of the commands used in order to enable this configuration first we have to define the public pool then we have to make the access list then we have to, to bind the NAT pool with the access list and finally as, I as I've been saying before uh, identify the interfaces and mark them here is like the process of dynamic NAT uh, we're going to focus only in the orange one uh, the purple one is the same uh, here we have that PC1 sends a packet with a private address R2 translates it using the first available inside global address the packet now is sent to the web server with the public address the web well, the server answers with a public address which comes through R2 which translates it to a private one so PC1 can receive the packet with its own private net well network address Finally, how to configure path. Uh, this path configuration is in case we have a NAT pool of addresses or several public addresses from which we can choose. Uh, the step one is to define the pool of global addresses. So as well, it's the same as dynamic NAT. And uh, then we have to create an access list with all the private addresses that can be translated or that should be translated then we have to establish an overload translation uh, well this is the one different step we have to make overload is when we change port numbers and uh, we have to do it by binding the access list with the pool and by allowing allowing yes, that uh, that pool and that access list to work with overload with command IP net inside source list the access list number the pool name and activating overload and finally we have to do the same we've been doing before uh, with the interfaces defining which interfaces is the inside network and which one is the outside network here is an example of how configuring path um, is made uh, with a certain topology but that was for multiple addresses uh, for a single address uh, the steps are a few we have to of course define a standard access list then we have to establish the dynamic source translation by specifying which access list we're going to use which is the exit interface and the overload options 
finally we have to do the same for the interfaces which one is the inside interface and which one is the outside interface as we can see once we have configured the pad with single address configuration and uh, now only one inside global address is going to act as our public address but port numbers are going to change thanks to the overload command how to verify NAT and BAT? well actually it's only how to verify NAT um, NAT can be NAT and static NAT and dynamic NAT can be determined or we can verify them with the show IP NAT translations and that command allows us to see like the NAT, the NAT table that it's enabled at that time in that uh, table we can see the inside global addresses the inside local addresses and in case it's well and in case it's, it is in use or during an active session we can also see the outside local address and the outside global address for dynamic NAT we have another command which is show IP NAT translation verbose uh, that gives us like a resume or a summary of the activity of that uh, public address or global insight address and there we can see which inside local address has been or is being using that uh, inside global address the time and the timeout in which that connection is going to expire and the use count the entry id and the lc entries it's give us like an extended version of the NAT translations command. Finally, we have an um, important topic uh, which is discussed at the end of the chapter. We have the port forwarding. Uh, it's useful for specific services and it must be done locally at border router. TCP and UDP ports are used. This means that if we have uh, specific services described in our network, we can forward those packets by the port. Uh, if we see the example TCP and UDP destination ports, we can see that all addresses using port 23 are going to be forwarded to the telnet server. Meanwhile, all packets or, or yeah, all packets using ports 20 and 21 are going to be forwarded to the FTP server. And finally, all packets with port 80 are going to be forwarded to the web server. These configurations can be used can can be achieved in the router. First, we have to establish an application name. In this case, the example is using a web server. Then we have to know the external port and the internal port. In this case, because it's a web server, we are using the external port 80 and the internal port 80. The protocol being used is TCP, it can be UDP also, and the device IP. This IP address is the one which all packets are being forwarded to. In this case, it's the 192.168.1.254. And this means that all packets with the external port 80 are going to be forwarded to the web server address with internal port 80 using TCP protocol. Well, that's the end of the chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.